Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Bantine, Chief Technologist for Red Hat's Western Region. And I've been with uh, Red Hat for about 13 years, working with strategic partners and customers up and down uh, the West Coast, primarily Silicon Valley, who are adopting emerging technologies, including DevOps and containers and container management. And today's talk is going to be about how containers and container management can enable uh, DevOps. So first off, I want to talk about some of the industry drivers going on out there. Here are some uh, pretty popular quotes about how, you know, half of the, almost half of the S&P won't exist in 10 years. And why is that happening? Well, certainly software is having a huge pack impact in disrupting the incumbents. And Andy Grove talked about how only the paranoid survive. It isn't about security. It's about when they're massive amounts of change in the industry and a company has to decide do they stay the course or do they pivot change direction so that they can potentially thrive or if they stay as is potentially fall by the wayside and certainly Intel has had many of those decisions uh, throughout their industry and they're not alone because take a look at what's going on in the industry retail finance media transportation you see it in the headlines uh, every day or every week there's a lot of new companies coming up driven by software innovation that are disrupting the incumbents. And what is the typical company to do, right? Take a look at the San Francisco taxi industry and they did nothing. Uh, and they were clobbered by Uber and Lyft and their ride share plummeted. Yellow cab taxi filed for bankruptcy last year, uh, all driven by a mobile application but also the ability for them to synthesize real-time data about their riders and drivers and create a market of supply that's balanced supply and demand. And so how can you do that in your enterprise? You know, how can you ensure that you're not left behind? Well, the typical enterprise takes six to nine months to deliver new software innovation. And what are the reasons for this? Right, as I talk with many companies in the Valley, what I found is that the organizations are typically siloed off. You talk to the operations team, the developers, the testers, and they've all evolved with their own set of processes, their tools, and it becomes very difficult to move the software application from dev test into production. And so they have a very manual uh, pipeline and it becomes very inefficient, taking them months to release that new software. And the reasons are many, right? manually configuring the servers, manually provisioning, not having access to dev and test environments on demand, not having access to a production-like environment on your laptop, and therefore running into issues for the first time in production. And so how does IT transform from a cost center into an innovation center? That's what the disruptors are doing, right? They're releasing software every day or every week or every couple of weeks and they're able to pivot and change course with that feedback loop and change direction so that they meet their customer de meet demands uh, quicker than their competitors. And so a lot of I pressure on IT to evolve. And so you're seeing a shift away from the waterfall method, months to years release cycle to one of days or weeks with DevOps. So breaking down those walls, bringing together your developers and operations. And then also, it's not just about the process, also the architecture of your applications moving away from this monolithic application to a microservice base that's loosely coupled so that each individual microservice can evolve at its own pace, use its own set of technologies, and quickly go into production. No longer are you betting the business every time you do a new upgrade, right? By simplifying and reducing the risk, you can easily upgrade and upgrade more frequently as well. Also, this small microservice doesn't make a lot of sense to deliver on a physical or virtual server, you know, gigabytes in size. Rather, a microservice generally in the 100 megabyte size that's where a container fits in nicely because it can start up quickly, but also is a lightweight footprint as well. So you can build it once and then move it as is from dev test into production without having to manually configure it or bring in uh, different libraries accidentally 
uh, through the test and production rollout. And then also delivering these on a dynamic infrastructure, whether it's private or public cloud. And a lot of uh, analogies here, but take a look at manufacturing. Uh, does anybody recognize what this is a photo of? Right, this is the Intel fab that's being built out in Arizona. And I mentioned Andy uh, Grove earlier. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, they had the Pentium bug issue. Does anybody remember that? Right, that was the floating point unit error. It cost Intel almost $500 million write-off and bad PR as well. And Andy learned from that. He realized that we need to be able to take customer feedback sooner, be able to monitor it, and quickly pivot as well. Now, the fab has been a key differentiator for Intel over the years. It hasn't been their architecture or their technology in the design. It's that they've been able to shrink the chip, gaining better uh, power efficiency, improving performance versus their competitors. But through this crisis, he also realized they need a software factory that sits behind this fab. And he invested tens of millions of dollars in a Linux farm, which enabled the chip designer to submit their tests early in the process and to get immediate feedback on whether that chip uh, design integrated well with the rest of the chip and be able to simulate it and get feedback any potential security or bugs in the design by running automated tests at scale. Also, another part, so that's continuous integration, a key part of DevOps. Uh, second factory here, I'm sure in Detroit you recognize this, the car factory, this is the Tesla automobile factory. And the reason I show this is because software is enabling not only the higher quality production of the vehicles with the robotics, but long after these cars have left the lot, for the first time, I can actually get a vehicle that improves over time. This changes the fundamental business model of the automobile industry. Not only is it a one-time purchase, I can now have a subscription and subscribe to software updates. Maybe there's security fixes or improvements to the 0 60 time, better battery efficiency, or the applications in the center console. But not only that, what if there's a security issue with an autonomous driving car. I want to be able to deliver that update quickly to the marketplace, rather than doing a vehicle, physical vehicle recall, which costs millions of dollars. Right? Almost every week you read about some sort of vehicle recall going on out there. Now with the ability to deliver a software update, I can quickly get in the hands of my customers, and therefore my car is going to be viewed as safer out there in the marketplace. And that's one of the key barriers to adoption of autonomous driving. And so by having that capability, able to gain customer confidence as well. So continuous delivery, key part of DevOps. And so I talk about this software factory and what it consists of. Not only is it technology, but also the culture, right? Bringing together your developers, your QA, and the operations team so that they're collaborating. And a lot of this mirrors the open source community. Right, transparency, inclusiveness, collaboration, those are all key principles of building out a successful open source community. Also, the process, right, evolving to an automated CI CD pipeline, right, borrowing the automobile industry's success with the assembly line, bringing that in house to the software, and getting immediate feedback as well into development, tests, and operations. So you can quickly pivot and change course, just like Intel did during the uh, penny and bug days. And of course, the technology. And as folks are embracing uh, DevOps, they're leveraging more and more open source, whether it's Linux, containers, the infrastructure layer, or the development tools as well. And these are the key building blocks for building out your own software factory, which can be a competitive differentiator for your organization. And what does this software factory look at? What are the capabilities? You know, typically you have the self-provisioning, so enabling the developer to get access to the tools and platforms as they need it at whatever scale, whether it's one or a hundred instances. Also having access to standard environments so that they can quickly get going and don't have to manually configure and spend time outside of developing business logic code. 
Also, the ability to auto scale so you efficiently use your resources and minimize your footprint when it's not needed. And the ability to manage this across the board. But with the container, you want to be able to manage that life cycle. Right? How do you manage the life cycle of a container as it moves from dev test into production? And keep track of that and be able to update that so that you can continuously deliver whether it's a security fix or an improved functionality for your customers. And so when I talk about the culture, you know, it's not just dev, QA, and operations. It's also successful DevOps companies are bringing in the line of business into the discussion, as well as their security teams, right? Security first mindset. You've seen all the recent news articles, Equifax, et cetera. You know, there's an increasing importance on security. And as you evolve to DevOps, it seems to be counterintuitive to being, keeping something secure because you're constantly updating it. And so you need to bring security not into the operations team, but into test and into development and the overall design of the product as well. And so containers enable dev DevOps because they enable the application developer and the business to quickly move forward and innovate and freeing themselves up from the common restrictions placed by operations and security teams around security policies or um, host level configurations. And they do that by abstracting the underlying host operating system with a container. And no longer is that container uh, just the application, but it brings in the application runtime as well as the operating system components, the libraries that it needs. And so it has everything that it needs to successfully run on a target system, whether it's physical, virtual, uh, private, or public cloud. And some of the common use cases we're seeing out there with containers include portability, because now that you have your application together with your configuration, or I'm sorry, the application code, as well as your underlying operating system, you can then move it quickly from private to public cloud or across providers. So that gives you freedom. Think about you know, the Unix days. We're kind of in the Unix days of public cloud right now. You have your AWS, your Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, et cetera. And they're kind of all like Unix was back in the days. They're unique APIs, unique platform. One day, you know, commoditization will take place, and that will bring you freedom. And you want your application to be abstracted from those providers so that then you have choice. Just like in the Linux x86 days, you had the ability to negotiate HP versus Dell versus IBM, right? And the reason was is because your application with Linux was able to be run on any of those platforms. And so you want to keep that in mind as you uh, build out your environment, and that's what containers help you in accomplishing. Also, enabling DevOps, right? CI, CD, enabling you to build it once and then move that application as is through the pipeline, and we'll talk more about that. Also, modernizing your application. So if you're building out microservices, you know, container is a nice uh, complement to a microservice because it's lightweight in size. And then a lot of customers I see are putting their existing apps in a container so that they can abstract that application and move it on to newer hardware and a newer host operating system. Other benefits include the ability to scale up and scale down quickly, uh, improve security, infrastructure optimization with that reduced footprint, and then also increasing reliability because you're abstracting the configuration and the data from the actual container and making it immutable. So the basic premise around containers is to build, ship, and run. Right? First off, you build with a uh, blueprint or your Docker file and you specify how to build that container. And you want to follow that as a best practice so you can always reproduce uh, that container image and quickly um, go back to earlier versions. Also, storing that image in a private registry is a good best practice for enterprises so that not only do you have control over who's putting in, but you'll have an audit trail and you have a copy of older versions if you ever need to go back in time. If your developer is depending on third-party libraries on public registries, those registries may not exist in six to 12 months. So 
you want to keep that in mind and set up something private in your uh, domain. Also, the runtime, right? Being able to have a standard runtime that runs across physical, virtual, public, private. And certainly, you know, as you get that guaranteed compatibility across runtimes, that's a key uh, benefit around containers. Just like in the Java, the JVM, you know, Linux is a key part of that because it provides some key technologies, not only the container runtime, but also security around uh, SE Linux, providing each process with a restricted access into explicit files via mandatory access controls. Also, namespaces provide security so that you have a full virtual like container environment that doesn't conflict with the host or other containers. So if there's a security issue, I don't have to worry about uh, root becoming root on the host. And then C groups providing quality of service across all your containers so that you don't have the noisy neighbor problem uh, from another container in a multi-tenant environment. But you know, more than containers, what about scheduling at scale, life cycle and health, discovery of other microservices that you may need to run, monitoring those containers, scaling, persistence, aggregation, and security. Those are some key concerns and requirements as you deploy containers at scale, and we'll talk about those. So first off, you know, the container software factory, uh, Kubernetes is a way to provide a container application platform out of the box for your container environment to manage at scale. How do you, you know, build out this environment without scripting it, doing it yourself? That's what Kubernetes is here to address. Being able to manage a large scale container environment so that you can focus on application code. And some of the capabilities it provides out of the box include things like declaratively stating how you want your environment or your application to look, right? You may want two web servers and a back-end database. And so it'll go ahead and deploy those containers out on your infrastructure by scheduling for an available resource that meets the requirements of that application, and then setting up the networking, and instantiating the services, a load balancer as well across the, the web services. And it will monitor and log the events as well from a centralized manner. And then I don't have to worry about the uptime. So here you can see there's two web servers and a back-end database, and they're successfully running and serving traffic via the load balancer. But it'll also detect if there's a failure, and here it detected a failure. And so I've stated that it needs to have two web servers and a database at all times, and so Kubernetes is intelligent enough to actually schedule a replacement container anytime one fails. And so it went ahead and provisioned another replacement resource and brought it back online. So now it keeps my application in a declared state of two web servers and one database at all times. Also, you know, how do I manage containers in a CI CD environment? Here's the typical flow you'll typically see in a CI CD. You have your developer and operations uh, using source code control. The checking in their Docker files, checking in their source code, and then having a build farm. So the key part of the build farm is to have reproducible builds of your containers. Right? You always want to be able to reproduce from a security perspective uh, and have them reproducible. And so one way to accomplish that is to use build images for the various application platforms you have that produce a, another target container consisting of your application and the application runtime and just the minimum OS libraries that are necessary. Right? It doesn't have the build tools in it. And it stores that artifact into your private image registry. Right? So you build it once, and then I can move it to test and then move it into uh, production if it completes my integration testing. And so let's talk about that continuous integration testing in this type of environment. So here's a typical uh, Jenkins uh, build uh, flow that you'll see uh, most developers' desktops or one of the other uh, solutions as well. 
So you have build number one, you have a pipeline showing you the different phases, success or failure, and then you have another instance, build number two and build number three. And so one of the differences in this continuous integration is that if you have a Java application, you're typically producing a jar file through this process. Well, with the container, now there's a big difference is that the container contains that application, but it also contains the application uh, runtime as well as the OS libraries that are necessary, right? So think about that. Now the developer is delivering to operations some of the OS and some of the application runtime. What about security? Who's checking for security in that situation? Right, the developer typically isn't doing that. And so one of the things you may want to consider doing is a converged software supply chain where operations continues to own the equivalent of the kickstart, but now it's in a Docker file. That's the OS. And then the middleware team will build upon that and layer on their application code. And then the software developer programming their Java application will inherit those two layers. So therefore, you can continue with each organization use, uh, being responsible for the same thing they are today in terms of security or updates, but now they're speaking the same language because it's all defined in the Docker file, and you have inheritance, so you're building upon each other as well. And that makes it easy to do bug fixes, security updates, because if one organization updates their layer, you could automate and trigger auto rebuilds for anybody that depends on those particular layers. Right. And so another best practice is also to treat containers as mutable uh, as you shift to containers. Uh, this will enable DevOps too because now the container will just contain code. The configuration will be outside of the container so I can easily scale up, scale down this application. And the configurations, if you're using Kubernetes, could be stored in config maps or if it needs to be encrypted in secrets uh, outside of the, uh, of the container image. And then the data also being outside of the container image, it can be stored on a persistent volume that can be provisioned by Kubernetes or uh, in a remote data service as well. And also for those containers, you want to be aware of the uh, container security implications. Here's an example of a C from left to right, C, Java, Node.js, and PHP application. It shows the different components that got pulled in when it was built. So in the second column, the JRE, the Java application, uh, was pulled in, bash and glibc. And that little triangle shows you how many security notifications have been released for that particular module. And the story here is be aware of where you're getting your components from, and then have an ongoing process uh, to scan these container images, whether it's at rest or a live instance, uh, on an ongoing basis. Because 66 notifications since RHEL 7 was released for the, uh, the JRE. And there's actually quite a few bit more since this, this slide was put together. Um, and so going back to that continuous integration, in this pipeline, you want to make sure that you put a security phase into your CI pipeline. So you automate the security check. Maybe that phase is every time you push to your private registry or you just have a scanning tool as a part of your build process to scan not only your uh, container image for security vulnerabilities, but also see if it conforms with your security policy as well. And flag that particular uh, container image, maybe tag it saying that it's unsecure so that if you go into production, you could prevent that particular container image from actually starting. Also, another key component to DevOps is around continuous delivery with, with containers. Talk about that. So as I mentioned, in development, you build your container image once, you put it in your container registry, and then you're going to push it into QA, staging, production. And anytime there's a bug in production or security issue in production, you go back to development, right? You don't go and patch production. Everything goes through the CI CD process in this DevOps flow. So 
that means everything went through a security scan in order to get to production as well. And so how do you manage this at, at scale? Right? In a typical environment today, if you're patching your production servers, you go out and do that because it takes six to nine months to roll out that new monolithic app version. And so you can't do that. But when you have this automated software factory, you have the capability to move software from dev into production in a matter of minutes. So now I can go back to development every time in a production-like environment, test it out, security scan, make sure the integration testing is completed, test at scale, et cetera, and then push it into production. And in order to produce it in production to 10,000, 1,000 different containers, I need some deployment strategies. So things like blue-green deployment, rolling updates, canary updates, or EB testing, you may be doing that today. You may have written some manual scripts to do that. Well, Kubernetes provides the ability to do that out of the box in an automated way. So first off, a blue-green deployment with Kubernetes, I can have version one out on my infrastructure in my virtual instance of production. And I could have another version being developed by my developers, put it through some CI testing. And this is in a virtual instance, a mirror of production, but not in production. And once it completes that testing, I can then just flip the virtual load balancer to the new version. If there's an issue with the uh, application or the update, I can then flip the route back to the previous version. I don't have to reset up the environment because it still exists. Another strategy is I could do a rolling update. Maybe I have a requirement to do zero downtime. Right? And so here I have version one at three different hosts, and I have version 1.2 being developed by my dev team. It's being put through test, and I want to gradually roll it out one by one. And so I rolled it out to one, but before it comes up and I add it to the load balancer, Kubernetes allows you to do a health check to see if it's even ready. Right? Is the application able to establish a connection with the database, perhaps? And if it does, then, OK, bring it online. And then as I gain confidence, I see real traffic, I can then roll it out 50%, 100%. I also can do A-B testing. Here's where I have version A of the app and version B. Maybe it's a security update or a new functionality, and I want to make sure that that function doesn't negatively impact my business. And so here I have version A routed, or version one with all traffic, and I get a 25% click-through rate. I have a security update or new feature, and I'm developing 1.2. Uh, and so I can route the uh, traffic 50% to version one and 50% to version 1.2. And all I had to do in Kubernetes is actually just flow the traffic from A to B 50%, uh, 50%. And what I notice is that the conversion rate actually improved. So that's a good sign. So I can go to 100% of that new version. But what if the conversion rate was negative? Again, I can switch the route back to the initial version, version 1, and keep it as is. Right? And so that minimizes downtime. It also uh, allows me to have a lot of flexibility in experimenting and trying things out right, and removing those barriers to innovating quickly. Also, uh, Kubernetes provides a continuous feedback loop with its central logging and monitoring of your containers as well. All right, so we talked about CI, CD. You know, Kubernetes also brings a lot of uh, features and functionality around securing your containers as well. I have another talk where I do a deep dive on these. It's available online. Uh, but also, it covers areas like securing your container hosts, storing images in your private registry, you know, securing your, your builds, uh, setting up a private registry, uh, integrating security into your CI CD scan, um, and then also talks about things like isolating your network so you can have multi-tenancy and restricting who can talk to who with, with network policy, as well as securing your storage, your APIs, and federation, as well as monitoring and, and logging as well. So 
there's a wealth of out-of-the-box security capabilities to help you uh, ensure that you do not make the headlines uh, with the next security hack. Um, in terms of ensuring that this project is successful and measurable, you know, here are some key DevOps metrics you may want to take a look at and consider uh, tracking as you make this transformation in your organization, including deployment frequency, change volume, lead time, failure rate, MTR, as well as service availability. Right? And so see, these are some key metrics. And then you can uh, measure your progress, whether it's trending the right direction. So I want to thank you for uh, having me speak today. Uh, my name is Chris Van Tyne again. I'm available at Red Hat email or uh, reach out on Twitter or on LinkedIn as well. So thank you very much for having me. I'll be out in the hall if you have any questions afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. So the remaining part of the day is we have